Good morning, and welcome to Seattle Atheist Church. Atheists, agnostics, skeptics, whatever you like to call yourself, you are welcome here. At Seattle Atheist Church, we call ourselves an atheist church because you will never hear anything supernatural promoted from the podium. Our church was founded on the principles of scientific naturalism and secular ethics. Truth claims are attempted here, and we stand ready to revise our thinking in light of new information. We believe in being excellent to all conscious beings, and we believe in good, because good works in non-mysterious ways. If that sounds right to you, then you are probably in the right place. So, welcome. Um, first, I'd like to let, it's not obvious to everyone, we always meet here every Sunday at noon, so see you next Sunday as well, we hope. Um, and then the third Sunday of the month, second or third, Brent? Second. Second Sunday of the month after church at um, 3 o'clock at the Wayward Coffee House on Roosevelt and 65th um, is board games. And then also the third Sunday, third Sat the third Saturday is the Secular Saturday Social, uh, which is at Browers in Fremont. Everyone is welcome. It's 21 and older, though, so please, hopefully, we will see you join us there, too. So the way we do it here is the members of ourselves give the talk. Oh, Burke Museum. October 13th, after church, we're going to the Burke Museum. Oh, wow, the Burke Museum is reopening, so it's going to be a big celebration. Yeah, it'll be fun. So, um, hope you plan to join us for that. So, we're going to have our talk, and then we'll get into a circle and have our discussion. And um, without further ado, come on up. Good morning. Um, I'm Eva, and my talk is on how to persuade people not to believe irrational things. Yes. How's that? That's great. Good. Okay. I'm afraid I might get a little further from it to draw things, so we'll see how that goes. Um, I'm just going to do this part on my phone, I think. Um, so, this is obviously going to be a really short, simple talk. Um, since humans are purely rational beings, persuading them of the truth is very simple. Uh, all, when you find someone's holding irrational belief, you simply present them with the carefully supported facts that disprove their belief. They'll realize the folly of their ways and follow your belief. And I heard some laughs because obviously it really doesn't work that way. Um, very, very occasionally you might find someone who is receptive to changing their mind through logic, but it's really, really an exception. Um, and even though you know that's the case, somehow on some level you still believe it should work and you fall into the trap of thinking that it will work. So here we are thinking that we're the rational ones and still believing that we can change people's minds with reason when we know that's not true. So let's have a little empathy for the people whose minds we're trying to change because we're there too. So why isn't that the way it works? Sorry, I'm gonna go ahead and close that. Um, sometimes, well, there are a lot of reasons why people are irrational, believe irrational things. So, one of them is sometimes what you're saying just sounds like blah, 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 or like the peanuts grown up voice. Because you're being too wordy, you're giving them more than they can process, and maybe it just sounds really abstract and they're bogged down in the details, they can't see the picture that you're trying to get across. When we're trying to get across a really complex idea, often we end up just drowning people in facts, and they can't grasp it, they tune out. Even if something is a really important topic and would be critical to someone's own interests. If we drown them in facts, they can't process it and it will seem boring. That's just how our brains work. Too much stuff to process will just sound like blah, blah, blah. So that's one of the problems. Um, we understand what we're saying. 
we think it should be comprehensible if we just throw the facts at them. And we try to throw them really fast because we know they're missing a bunch of facts, but we've probably learned this stuff over years. They can't learn it in the two minute conversation we're trying to have with them. So we need to arrange things differently. Another reason that people often believe irrational things is cognitive errors. We all fall into really predictable <coughs> cognitive errors. This is not about being stupid, and it's not even about being ignorant. Very intelligent people who are experts in their field will still fall victim to cognitive errors. Um, there are trained nurses and doctors who think that there are more emergency room visits at the full moon. There aren't. There have been studies on it. It is not true, but people feel like it's true because they notice when it is true. That's a really, really common cognitive error. So that's another category of why people believe irrational things to begin with. Uh, this is an elephant. It's not a Republican. We may talk about that later. This is an elephant. You know that. This guy doesn't know that. He thinks it's a rope. This guy doesn't know that. He thinks it's a snake. This guy doesn't know that, he thinks it's a wall. If you're familiar with the story of the blind men and the elephant, um, they're all feeling different parts of the elephant and getting a partial impression. We all come from our experiences and our information sources. If I've been reading one information source and someone else has been reading or watching some other information source, we're gonna have really different impressions of what the world is like. If I've had one kind of upbringing and you've had another, I'm going to have a really different impression of what the world is like. And our impressions of what the world is like lead us to think different things are believable. I don't think it's believable because it doesn't match my experience or what I've been seeing. So that blind men and the elephant thing is a major factor in why people believe irrational things. They may have had experiences that did not lead them to believe that what's actually true is true. So it doesn't match statistically their experience. Here's another one. This is a frame. We put our pictures, our ideas, into a frame. We don't always use the same frame. We may have different frames that we use in different contexts. But a frame is a worldview, and it's a way of thinking about the world and the topic at hand. If I'm using one frame, and you try to tell me something that fits in a completely different frame, it may not fit in mine. It may just go right over my head. It's not that I'm rejecting your idea. It's, it doesn't even make sense to me. It doesn't fit in my worldview at all. I didn't comprehend it. Maybe I didn't even hear it because it made so little sense. So that's a major factor. We have to understand people's frames and not work with their frames, I'll get to that later, but we need to acknowledge their frames and that they're there before we can get new ideas across. And there's another reason why people do not think rationally. They have flipped their lid. <laughs> this is a person who cannot think because they're in a panic state, they're in a crisis state, and their cerebellum has literally gone offline. They're, they're not processing like a human anymore. They're processing like a scared lizard or maybe at best a monkey. Um, when we flip our lids, we cannot analyze. We cannot think, oh, logically this must be true. We're like, where did that leopard go? Where's the exit? Even if there is no physical danger to us, all that's happening is someone is talking to us about something that is unfamiliar. This is just the way we work. When our lids are flipped, we cannot analyze. And the final one is self-defense. This is a border wall. This border wall is how we protect ourselves from those scary foreign ideas. Never mind that those foreign ideas may be something that we need. Never mind that 
border wall may not be the best way to keep them out in any case. Never mind that those ideas may be the best thing ever. When we hear new ideas, it is threatening to us on a basic level. Even if you think you're open to new ideas, we all have this element in us. We all think of ourselves on some level as our ideas. And when those ideas are threatened, our self-defense kicks in. It's really, really hard to get over that. I encourage trying to get over it, but you're never completely gonna get over it. So if you're telling somebody something that contrasts with their worldview and their identity, it's gonna scare them. And you're gonna trigger some defense mechanisms. So these are the basic reasons why someone might believe irrational things, none of these are susceptible to logical argument. Do you mind uh, holding it up? Sorry. Is it, you, is that hard to see? A little bit. Okay. So we've got the blah, blah, blah factor. It's just boring and too detailed and too abstract. We've got the cognitive bias, cognitive errors factor. We've got the blind man and the elephant factor that people are what people can understand about the world is influenced by what information they have and what experience they've had. We've got frames, which determine what you can comprehend. And these are related, but not quite the same thing. There's having your lid flipped so you can't think, and there's defending your identity and your ideas as soon as you encounter something new. So those are all factors in why people believe irrational things. And, like I said, none of them will be corrected by you arguing facts with them. Facts do not fix these. Frustrating though that is. So what does? Um, oh, I, sh I should go over this. We've had talks about this, but there is, there's a defense that kicks in. If you present someone who has an, a false belief with facts that contradict that belief, they actually end up with that belief being stronger. There's a, there's a kind of a, a blowback to it that where they end up defending so hard that they believe the thing even harder, even though you just showed them an article with facts to back it up that said, no, actually, that's not true. Then they become convinced, oh, the media's in on it too. This guy giving me the article is in on it too. It must be true, they're trying to hide it. it you know, they come up with all kinds of rationalizations. So you can't just contradict them. It doesn't work. I wish it worked, but it doesn't. Um, one example of this, besides these studies that have been done, there are doomsday cults. There's like flying saucer cults and things like that. There are people who are convinced the world is going to end on such and such a day. You know, get your soul in order, donate all your money to whatever, uh, put on the right sneakers, whatever. They have these plans about what you're supposed to do to get into heaven or to get to the other planet or whatever it is. It's going to happen on this day. Invariably, that day passes. <clears throat> what do these cults do? You would think they would go, oh wow, our leader was wrong, this whole premise was wrong, never mind, I'll go home to my family. They don't. Overwhelmingly, these people dig in their heels, look to their leader, go, what went wrong? The, reader, the leader comes up with some reason why, oh, it wasn't that day, we made this tiny little error, but the premise is right, and here's a new day, my, my new calculations. Or we did so well that we put it off. And now we have to convince more people. So they become more strongly evangelistic, more committed. Part of that is they've already put in a lot to this premise. And once you've committed your whole life, maybe all your money, maybe you've abandoned friends and family for this idea, you're not just gonna drop it when it turns out to be wrong. You're gonna go, can't be wrong. There must be some other explanation. So we can't argue, we can't show them contradictory evidence to change their minds. We might do that for other reasons. We might do it to show other people. But that person right there in the moment who's caught in the irrational belief is almost certainly not gonna be convinced by facts. So I'm gonna draw a picture, because that's part of it, of what does work.
doesn't have to be good at drawing or put the time into it. Do you mind again? So, uh, we, will, we will go over this, but I wanted to draw the picture first. <laughs> Give you the big picture, as it were. <laughs> so, there are some things that work to sway people who are thinking irrational. Um, one of them is telling stories. Parables, fairy tales, um, things like that. They're classic teaching tools. They get memorable lessons into people's heads. Telling your own personal story or a story of someone you know or a vivid story about a stranger even can work too, but it's better if it's a personal link. Um, it makes much more of an impact than giving people statistics. So this person is telling a story. They've got a book, but they're telling the story out loud because that helps with the connection too. Um, they don't remember, people don't remember isolated facts, but they remember a narrative. It makes it make sense, it makes it personal, it makes it something they can relate to. And we can be driven by a story, even if that narrative has been cherry-picked or even wholly invented, unfortunately. Um, we've had some really successful historical examples of very misleading narratives, like the welfare queen. Um, the, the hot coffee lawsuit, where people distorted that message to mean something really the opposite of what really happened. I don't know whether you're aware of the woman who had hot coffee spilled on her. She was really, really badly injured by coffee that was stupendously hot after McDonald's had been warned several times that that was dangerously hot and they needed to change it. This was not a frivolous lawsuit, and yet it's become the classic example of frivolous lawsuits. Um, so sometimes these stories, when they get picked out for a purpose and they get twisted, they can end up taking over thinking about a whole topic. I am not suggesting that you take a story that is misleading or lie in your story. I'm saying it's a powerful method and you should use it for good. Um, so use stories that are real, that are representative, that people can relate to. Uh, another example, another uh, tactic that is very useful for changing people's minds that has nothing to do with logic is music. This person's actually singing their story. Um, music and poetry are also incredibly long-standing ways of teaching and of making, making ideas memorable. Um, classically, stories were often either set to music or rhythmic. Uh, epic poetry, ballads, they set stories that were real and historical, or that were believed to be real and historical, um, into a more memorable and more emotionally impactful format. So, uh, today we use, uh, well we still have nursery rhymes, just barely. Uh, we have political slogans, we have advertising jingles, we have proverbs. If it rhymes or alliterates, there's part of our brain that thinks it's more likely to be true. It's weird. Um, but, but we actually kind of go, oh yeah, that must be true because it rhymes. It sounds ridiculous when you say it, and yet if someone gives you a rhyming slogan, it seems kind of right somehow. Um, it seems true to our hind brains, and we're also more likely to repeat it still intact because it has to rhyme so we come up with the words more reliably. Um, protest chants and national anthems bring people together in their cause. Um, songs, uh, protest songs, and songs like Blowing in the Wind, or A Change is Gonna Come, or Strange Fruit, they become things that everybody's heard, and they help shape national and international thinking about a topic because they've presented this in an emotionally accessible way and a way that we remember. And it's like, oh, I never thought about that topic that way before. You may not be thinking about it consciously, but it affects how you view the topic if you've heard a song that presents a certain view. And they help create social shift. So we've got music. We've also got pictures. This whole thing's a picture, obviously. Um, not only literal pictures, but also verbal imagery and figures of speech will make things more convincing, more persuasive, and also more memorable. Um, our verbal abilities have kind of metastasized and taken over how we think, especially in modern culture. We prioritize the word and logic way over things like physical ability, art, music, emotion, and kind of 
crowds out our use of those ways of thinking and being, but if you can use them all together, your message will be far more powerful. You'll be using your whole brain and having your listeners and viewers use their whole brains to process your message. So one example of this, I'll probably spend a little more time on this than I should. I can find the, oops. Um, I should have pulled this up on the laptop first. Um, oh, never mind, I don't think I have time to show you the actual graphs. Um, but the Space Shuttle Challenger, it went down because a critical component, the O-rings, failed. It caught fire, it crashed into the sea, people died. The reason this happened is a failure of information presentation. NASA knew they had these tests and some of them had failed. And when, when certain people at NASA presented the information about the past attempts to their higher ups, they did a really bad graphic presentation. They had a whole bunch of pictures of rockets lined up with notes about which part of them had failed and then if they had succeeded, they were mixed in. They're all in chronological order. And the temperature that it was that day was written underneath. So a big, long string of pictures of rockets with like bits marked out and the temperatures at the bottom. This did not get across the critical piece of information that the only times they'd succeeded were when the weather was warm. And if you graphed it by temperature, that was blatantly apparent. They had had a couple of fails when it was warm, bad, bad fails when it was really cold, and no successes when it was cold. And if that graph had been presented, they wouldn't have sent the Challenger up that day. They would have gone, there's no way it's gonna succeed, there's way too much danger. But if you don't show that in a picture that's presented the right way, that information doesn't get through. A list of dates and temperatures and what succeeded and what failed is not going to get that information across. Um, if you want the full story on that and a whole bunch of other really great examples of good and bad graphic presentation, that's in uh, Edward Tufte, the visual display of, of uh, quantitative information. Um, another piece, repetition. Uh, people need to hear things a bunch of times, almost all the time, before they actually process them and remember them. The Karamazov brothers have a bit that they do that says, repetition, number one, number one rule of comedy, repetition isn't everything. Number two rule of comedy, repetition isn't everything. <laughs> number three rule of comedy, It's funny, and it's true. Um, so when you hear something enough times, it begins to sound familiar, and when something sounds familiar, it begins to feel true. It's like we adopt it as part of us because we've heard it over and over. And that's kind of scary when you think about all the advertising that's out there and all the political messages that are out there and all the really unpleasant social messages that are out there. We need to be aware that we need to be repeating our messages too. Saying them once is not enough. Another thing that you need is a coherent frame. Um, the right wing in the US has a coherent frame that it works from. All of its positions are part of one worldview. Um, George Lakoff has written about this in multiple books. Uh, one of them is Don't Think of an Elephant. Um, which is about how the right wing uses its model and how the left wing doesn't really have one coherent model that it works from and presents. It has a bunch of positions, and they do come out of some coherent values, but we don't normally present that as part of the argument. Um, the, the right wing positions are pretty much all part of a strict father model of the family that's extended to the government that's extended to running the world. So there's patriarchy, there's uh, respect for older people, there's misogyny, because the man is supposed to be the one who's in charge. There's an assumption that children are incompetent and that you have to train them with punishment and reward 
and have them grow up to be responsible, independent adults, at least if they're men, and responsible, obedient adults if they're women. There's a whole bunch of stuff that's all wrapped up in this model, and it leads to all the positions of the Republican Party. You can predict them from this model. Um, Lakoff recommends that the left wing pick up the nurturing parent model, but that's not ideal itself either because we don't tend to want to think of people as children when they're not. So there can be argument about whether that's the right approach or we need <coughs> something else, but certainly the Republicans' approach is powerful because it is a coherent model. If you believe in the strict father model of the family, it's very easy to extend that to government and other things. Um, another piece is liking the messenger. You want to be friends with your audience or at least be seen as a benevolent person or at least someone who's not an enemy. <clears throat> this person has made a connection with their audience. They're smiling, they're sharing an experience with them, and they know their audience. Their audience is part of the picture too. It's important that you connect with the person you're speaking to, that they see you as a person and as someone that they have something in common with. Um, I mean, Dale Carnegie has the classic book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, and there's still a lot of value in that book today. It's basically about charm and a kind of authenticity that people can see um, and understanding your audience. Um, if you have common values with the person that you can invoke, that's ideal. Work from those common values. If you don't have common values that you're aware of, try to find something, even if it's a trivial something. Maybe you like the same sports team, or maybe you're wearing the same shirt. You know, it, it doesn't have to be something meaningful for it to trip something in our brains that makes me go, oh, this person's like me, and that makes us more receptive to their message. <laughs> and if your target audience is very different from yourself, you may have to work to find that. But generally, even if someone has very different values that they're presenting, there's something at core you can agree with, like uh, loyalty to family, for instance. Usually both left and right wing can come down to some piece of that, even if they enact it differently. Um, or freedom, what do you mean by valuing freedom? Well, maybe go different directions with it, but that's still something that you're agreeing on and can try to work towards. Um, and one more piece is following through the logic. There's actually a little dot-to-dot -dot image in this image. Arguing with someone by saying, but this would lead to that, you don't want that. Unfortunately, that doesn't work great. But helping them see it for themselves is very powerful. So if you take someone's argument seriously, that you know doesn't make sense, that is ridiculous. How can you believe that? Well, Take them seriously, say, okay, can you walk me through how that would work? And if you keep receptively asking, okay, so tell me more about this bit. How, how do you picture that working? Um, often, people will kind of peter out because they'll get to a point where they realize that doesn't quite make sense. Don't jump on them then. This is not debate class, it's not a tournament. And if you jump on someone, you end up putting them into what Sun Tzu called death ground, where they have to fight for survival. Don't put them in that position, you'll strengthen their beliefs. Let them sit with that cognitive dissonance. You might say something like, huh, and let them think. They may not change their mind that day. Don't make them admit it to you, but they will wander off with a little more food for thought and possibly, if not change their mind, at least not argue for the ridiculous thing anymore because they notice something's funny about it. So, in summary, if you are confronted with someone who believes something you know to be contrary to reason, remember you can't counter it with reason. They may hold irrational ideas because they haven't been presented with the rational ones in a way that makes sense to them yet because they're stuck in cognitive biases, because they have a different worldview than you and they haven't seen the bits that make sense to you, they're working from a different frame, they have flipped their lid and can't process, 
or they're feeling self-defensive because you're challenging their identity. The way to counter that is not with rationality. It's with giving them a new frame, repetition, telling stories, letting them make the connections, making a personal connection with them. One small thing to add here, if I may. You drown the guy in facts, and you're just wasting both your time. Outside his brain, he'll flip his lid, he'll think of fear and crime. You've got to tell a story, and you've got to make it rhyme. Then say it one more time. <laughs> Monkey brains, we've got to use them. Monkey brains, the facts confuse them. Friendly truths, and they will choose them. Just say it one more time. <laughs>